My name is Trey Kelly. I'm the lead pastor here. Thank, wow, both sides. Thanks, guys. If you've never been wooed in stereo, it's pretty cool. Uh, thanks for joining us in the room. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, we are in the middle of our series called Miracles, where we are looking at uh, some of Jesus' most famous miracles because there's always a message behind the miracle. Uh, I want to start today with a question. This is a participatory question. I do want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand if you ever at any level, in any capacity, have coached a sport. You ever coached your kids' sports? You ever coached high school level, college level, pro? You know, I saw a few hands up when I said pro. Like, do we really have professional coaches? It's like you were waiting. So you can ask for professional coaches when you raise your hand. Okay, you can put your hands down. Um, I, too, have participated in, in coaching sports. I am, I am now retired. Uh, me, and, me and Coach K, we both decided to retire at the same time. Um, and unfortunately uh, for me, my kids never liked to play the sport I could actually coach. Um, I was decent, and I use that word loosely, decent at basketball. And so I understood, I'm 6'5", and I understood basketball. And so I think my kids like maybe play basketball once or twice. And I was like, yes, I can actually help. But they always wanted to play baseball. I quit baseball when I was in the sixth grade because I couldn't hit, and baseball isn't fun if you can't hit. So I quit playing baseball. But my kids love, love, love baseball. They've always played baseball. And so I got very lucky. I was able to hitch my wagon to two guys who knew how to coach baseball. Um, I had two friends, both played in college, and they wanted to coach baseball. And I was like, can I, can I help? And so I, was, uh, I helped coach uh, with those guys. We actually, not to brag, um, we ended our career uh, final season, undefeated regular season and championship. And we, like George Costanza, said, we're out. That's it. We ended on a high note. I wish I could say I contributed to those teams. I did not. I could not help with strategy. I could not help with form. I could not help with technique. So I decided to make myself the chief encouragement officer. I kind of took it as my role to kind of encourage the kids as we were playing baseball because I don't know if you've ever watched 9-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds play baseball. Because baseball is a hard game. But if you've ever seen a baseball player strike out, you know what I'm about to talk about. Because they strike out, and it's like they've never struck out before. It's like they're unaware this is a thing that can happen in baseball. It's like no one else has ever struck out before. Or they make an error, they mess up, and, and, and you can watch it happen. As they're making their way from the plate, from the field, to the dugout, it starts with anger, like they're just mad, but it immediately turns from anger to sadness, despair, the lip pokes out, occasionally there's tears involved, and the telltale sign that you are in trouble. So when they drop their head, they drop it on the way of the dugout, they sit down on the bench, and they just drop their head, and they live in defeat. And so if I said it once, I said it approximately 10 billion times. Hey, 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 keep your head up. Keep your head up. Because I don't know much about baseball, but as a grown adult human being, I know that baseball is very difficult. I know that the greatest baseball players of all time failed more than they succeeded. They failed 65 to 70% of the time every time they go to the plate. And what I know is, hey, you had a bad at bat. It was a bad swing. It'll be fine. It was a good pitch. Keep your head up. Shake it off. You get another at bat. You get another swing. You get another chance. Because if you don't, if you don't get out of your little spiral that you're in, if you live defeated, well, then the game's over. Because you'll just go up to the plate again and you'll just swing. And I watched it over and over and over again. These kids who were super competitive. Are your kids super competitive? My kids are super competitive. I don't know where they get it from. Probably their mom. But they're super competitive. <laughs> oh, she is so competitive. Yeah. I'm just laid back. But, she... but they, there's so much energy and angst that I watched it. One little tiny setback. <laughs> Utter and complete defeat. And the game's over. Well, because they couldn't get perspective. Now, I'll tell you that story for two reasons. One, I think it sets us up perfectly for where we're going today, for the miracle we're going to look at. But also, I'm pretty sure what happened 
to those kids happens to us in life when we experience a setback, when we experience a failure, when we experience something unexpected, it's easy for that setback to set in. It's easier for us to go from that was just a defeat to I am now defeated. It's easy for us to live life thinking, well, it's never going to get better. Well, that relationship didn't work out. I'll never get married. That job didn't work out. I'll never be successful. I wasn't able to close that deal. I'll never make a sale. Have you noticed that sometimes when bad things happen in your life, when negative things happen, when you have a setback, it can feel like life is over. And the reason it feels that way is because you do the same things those kids did. We look down. We drop our heads. And we walk around defeated. And so today, we are going to look at one of Jesus' most famous miracles. It's where he brings his friend Lazarus back to life. If you grew up in church like I did, you probably heard this miracle taught a thousand times. But you probably missed what was going on around the miracle. Because the message behind this miracle to Mary, to Martha, Lazarus' brothers, and to every single one of us in this room is four words. Keep your head To explain what I mean, I want to dive in to the story. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 11. John is the fourth biography we have of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John was one of Jesus' best friends on earth, and he wrote this biography of Jesus to kind of give us a fuller, more complete picture after he had read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's like, guys, you missed all these stories. And so he wrote this fourth biography to kind of round out Jesus. And he's the one who records for us this story of Jesus bringing his friend Lazarus Back to life. So if you have your Bibles, like I said, John chapter 11. If not, it's going to be up here on the screen. Let's dive in. Because here's what John tells us. He says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. And then he gives us a little background. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. She gives Jesus an offering. At the end of the story, you're going to find out why. So he knows Mary and Martha. He's friends with Mary and Martha. So much so that here's what Mary and Martha say. They say, the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Their brother, Jesus' friend, is sick, and they do what they're supposed to do. They go to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, our friend is sick. Your friend is sick. My brother, we need your help. If you were raised in church, if you consider yourself a Christ follower, if you're here today, you don't consider yourself a Christ follower. You're just looking for Jesus. You're probably coming because you need some help in some area. That's why we turn to Jesus. It's okay. He understands. But we turn to him and say, hey, man, I could use some help. That's what we're taught to do. I want you to see Jesus' response. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. He tells his disciples right then, this isn't the end of the story. He said, no, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. It happened for the glory of God. It happened so that God's name would be made more famous. Now, it's easy to read that and put two and two together and hear Jesus saying, I made Lazarus sick for my glory. You could hear that. You could read that that way. That is not what Jesus is saying. That is to fundamentally misunderstand who Jesus is. Jesus does not send sickness. Jesus does not cause sickness. Sickness is the result of evil, which was brought into the world by sin. When we chose to sin, we brought that into the world. The God of the universe sent his son to rescue us from that, to save us from that. So what does this mean? Well, it means what we just sang about in the last song. It means that what the enemy means for evil, God can turn to good. See, this is the promise of what it means to be a Christian. That any setback in our lives, anything that comes into our lives because of a sin we commit or just because of sin in general, like like sickness, illness, all those things, it does not mean God caused them, but God can step in and turn them to good. In fact, he can use them to reveal his glory. 
I point that out because what a shift it would provide in our perspective and in our thinking. If every time we experience a setback, the first question was, I wonder what God's going to do with this. I wonder what good thing God has planned in this moment. Because what Jesus was revealing is he always has something planned. He didn't cause it. He didn't cause it. But he's saying, I can use it. I can use it for good. And so he tells his disciples, I've got something big planned. And then he says these words. So all, John tells us these words. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. He didn't rush to Bethany. He didn't drop what he was doing. He stayed where he was. Now, on the face of it, it could look as if Jesus was ignoring his friends. But we know that's not what he's doing because in the previous verse he said, I got a great plan for this. See, he wasn't ignoring, he was investing. But what happened in my life, in your life, in our life is when we feel like God's not responding, when we feel like he's not answering, we feel like he's not there for us, we feel like he's not coming through, we feel like he's ignoring, what if this verse could remind us, no, 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 he's investing, he's preparing. He's sowing. He's got something bigger and better. He's going to reveal his glory in this. I don't know how, but I trust that he will. That's what he's trying to teach his disciples and us through this moment. And the primary obstacle to us seeing what God is doing is the direction of our eyes. Will we choose, as the people are in this story, as my kids did and your kids did when we play sports. If we choose to live defeated, if we choose to let our eyes go down, it's easy to miss what Jesus is doing. That's why the message of this story is despite the heartache, despite the setback, despite what's happening, keep your head up. Because that is where you'll see Jesus. And that is where you'll see what he's up to. So, Jesus kind of informs his disciples what he's going to do, and then they hang out for a couple of days, and then Jesus says, okay, time to go. It's time for us to go to Bethany. And on the way, the disciples are asking questions. They're confused. What's going to happen? And so Jesus is like, hey, before we get here, I need to go ahead and make this pretty clear to you guys. I need to tell you what we're about to walk into. And so he tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <sighs> disciples have been with Jesus for a while now, and so they're like, that's not what I thought was going to happen. That's not what I thought you were going to say. Before they even have a chance to respond, Jesus says this. He says, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Where everyone else was scared, Jesus was sure. You know why? Because he's the God of the universe and he knows the future. We don't. That's why he's in charge and we're not. So he shows up. He gets there. And this is what he's told. When he arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. So this has been going on for a while for Mary and Martha. Because her brother was sick. They sent word for Jesus. Probably took a day or two to get to Jesus. Jesus then said, doesn't respond and doesn't come immediately. Then he has to travel. So not only have they experienced the heartache of their brother being sick, they've experienced the heartache of their brother dying, and he has now been buried for four days. I tell you that because I do not fault them for their perspective. They were experiencing massive grief. They were heartbroken. And it's why throughout this entire story, you are never going to see Jesus rebuke the people with their heads down. He is constantly going to love and assure them that he's with them and he's working on their behalf. Because he shows up and he sends word that he's there because he wants to see Mary and Martha. And here's what we're told. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha leaves, Mary stays. You know why? Because Mary had her head down. Mary was defeated. Mary was depleted. Mary was, was distracted by her despair, so much so that the answer showed up and she missed it. 
Jesus showed up. The guy you call for, I'm here. Heads down. See, it can happen to us. What might God be trying to say to you? What might God be trying to encourage you in? Where might he be trying to direct your next steps that you're missing right now because your head is down? And it's not just Mary. Martha's there too. Martha's head's down. Martha, Martha's living defeated. She, she does the right thing. She knows what she's got to do. So she goes out to see Jesus. And here's what she says. She says, Lord, if only you had been here my brother would not have died. If, if only you had been here on time. And then she says, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. So you hear that and you're like, okay. All right, Martha. Martha with a little faith there. Okay. Martha's like, I'm sorry you weren't here, but I know God's going to give you whatever you ask. Martha's saying the right things. But she's not feeling the right She's not believing the right things. How do I know? Because she looks at Jesus and says, I wish you'd been here sooner, but I know God's going to do whatever you ask him to do. And here's how Jesus responds. Your brother will rise again. Like, yeah, I'm here. Let's go get him. But Martha doesn't break out into a dance. Martha doesn't say, yes, you're here. You're going to save him. Look what Martha does. Martha says, yes, Lord, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Which is true. That is true. That is the comfort we give each other when we lose a loved one, that through faith in Christ we will all spend eternity together. And Martha had probably had that said to her hundreds of times. Your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. But see, because her head was down, she did not know whose voice was speaking to her in that moment because it wasn't some ordinary voice. It was the Son of God. It was Jesus Christ. And he was saying, I'm going to raise your brother. And she goes, I know he'll raise again on, on the last day. And Jesus is like, no, what? No, I'm here. Let's go. See, it's hard to know who's talking when your head's down. When you live defeated, all the voices get jumbled. Your friends' voices, your family's voices, culture's voices. It's hard to recognize Jesus' voice because it sounds a lot like other people's voices. That's what's happening to Martha. She's just hearing the Son of God say this thing that she can't identify because she won't look at it because her head's down, because she's living defeated. And Jesus doesn't get angry at her. He doesn't get mad. He actually tries to draw her back. He says, hey, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. And we know this. You know this is true. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. And then he says, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe what he's really saying is, do, do you believe I am who I say I am? And she desperately wants to. And with her word, she says she does. But he just told her what he was going to do, and she minimized it. She minimized the miracle because she didn't get who it was that was talking to her. Look at what she says. She says, oh, I've always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. I've, I've always believed it. I've always believed it. We may say the same thing. We've always believed it. In times of despair, can belief become trust? Can belief become action? She believed it, but she lived defeated. She wouldn't lift her head up. She wouldn't connect with her Savior. She wouldn't step towards him. We do the very same thing. And the message of this miracle is the belief has to produce some action. It is in the times of despair, it is in the tough moments when Jesus says, I've got you. I am at work. You can trust me. That we say, I know Jesus, I trust you. I do, I do, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. I'm not going to do anything, but I trust you. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Keep your head up. Look at me. Connect with me. Trust me. Let's move. Martha couldn't do it at that moment. Martha couldn't look at Jesus. And in fact, Martha goes back into the house. But don't miss this. Martha couldn't look, but Jesus kept loving. He didn't stop. He's like, okay, she's really hurting. I know what I'm going to do. Martha goes in the house, and Martha tells Mary, again, hey, Jesus is here, and he'd really like to see you. So Mary gets up. 
kind of cleans herself off, and she goes out to see Jesus. But all the people in the house didn't hear Martha tell Mary that Jesus was there. They just see Mary getting up and Mary leaving the house. They assume Mary's going to the grave to grieve. So everybody in the house kind of follows Mary. Mary's kind of walking out in a day. She sees Jesus, and here's what we're told. we told that she falls at his feet. And again, she says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. They get it. They get Had you been here before, you could have healed him. But there's some implication in their hearts that Jesus was too late. Ah, you didn't didn't show up in enough time, Jesus. You're too late, Jesus. Same thing can happen to us. Through circumstances in our life, through situations, it can be super easy to think certain seasons in our life are gone and it's too late for God to do anything about it. Can I just tell you right now? In your own personal life, your own personal steps, your own personal development, I need you to hear me. There's no such thing as too late with God. You know how I know? You're breathing. And if you're breathing, it's not too late. God is up to something. God is working. And if we believe and if we trust and if we obey and if we follow, we can step into whatever he has planned. But that is difficult, if not impossible, to receive and to feel when we live defeated. And Jesus is seeing it. He's seeing Mary acting the way she's never acted before. He's seeing Martha acting the way he's never acted before. He's seeing his disciples, and he told them what he was going to do. And everybody's just so defeated. And then John tells us a fascinating, fascinating picture of what Jesus does next. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Now, please, this sounds like he's saying he got mad at them for crying. That's, that's not at all what was happening. He was angry at sin. He was angry at what sin has, had caused to people he loved. And he was angry that that sin had defeated them to the point that they couldn't see the answer when it was right in front of them. It broke his heart to see people he loved living defeated. They were so blinded by the pain, they couldn't receive his promise that he was there. They were blinded by the temporary circumstances of what was happening. And he got angry, not at them, at the situation. And My guess is every parent in the room understands this. If you've ever spent time over breakfast, time over dinner, time late at night trying to console a child who's defeated, I'll never be able to pass this test. I'll never get this homework done. I'll never be good enough to make that team. I'll never be able to this. I'll never be able to do that. Am I the only one that's had to have those conversations with their children? (laughs) And we don't get angry at them much. Um, (laughs) No, we don't. We get angry at the defeat because we see that it's a lie. And what we want to say to them is, man, if you could just see you like I see you, if you could just see the potential I see, if you could just see the gifting I see in you, you would never live defeated. We all can relate to that, right? And for the dads in the room, we're earthly dads. Imagine how great our Heavenly Father is at that, at seeing our potential. And imagine how frustrated He gets when he knows he's about to solve a situation, but we're missing it because we're living defeated. That's what's happening here. And so Jesus decides to do something about it. He asks the question, where have you put him? Where is he? <laughs> and then I love this next line. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. Jesus was so mad he had to walk it off. Like, Don't you like that? That the humanity of Jesus was like, I just, Peter, you, I, I need five minutes. Just let me have some time. No, I can't answer your question about heaven right now. I need a minute. He just had to cool off, man. He had, he had, he had to, and he was still angry when he got there. And he gets there, and there's a, there's a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance, and he says, roll the stone aside. Now, again, who in their right mind who knows Jesus, who understands Jesus, can't see where this is going at this point. Who can't possibly see? Oh, he 
he's going to bring you back to life. I'll tell you who can't see it. Martha can't see it. You know what Martha's response is when he says, roll the stone away? She protested, but Lord, it's been four days. The smell will be terrible. <laughs> it's like, Martha, come on. Martha's got her head down. Martha's living defeated. Martha has no idea that the miracle is about to happen. She has no idea that Jesus is about to bring her brother back, even though he told her that's exactly what he was going to do. Head down. Protesting about earthly things. And you know, part of me thinks that at that point, Martha, she's a smart woman. She's heard Jesus. Her brain has kind of started saying, do you think it's possible? Is he maybe going to bring my brother back to life? I think she's thought about it intellectually. I think she was so hurt and so broken, she was afraid to hope. She couldn't bring herself to do it. See, that's what happens when we live with our head down, when we live defeated. We fear hope. Because hope can lead to heartbreak. And when you're already defeated, the thought of more heartbreak, more defeat is crushing. And so Jesus brings her to the point of her miracle. And she still can't see it. See, I wonder today, how many of us, we've wanted something, we've given up on it. We've accepted our current circumstances. And we're missing all the moments of Jesus saying, no, 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 just follow me. I got, I got something planned. Just, just, just take this step. I got something cool that I'm going to do for you. Just, just take this step. I've been at work. See, you thought I was ignoring. I've been investing. And there's something really cool coming. And like maybe, maybe the miracle is right here. But you can't see it. Because your head's down. And as I say that in this moment, it's easy for you to want to beat yourself up even more. To add guilt to the defeated pile. Well, I'm just not strong enough to pick my head up. If I was better, I could do that. That's not how Jesus feels. He says, roll the stone away. Mary said, I mean, Martha says, isn't it going to smell bad? Jesus doesn't rebuke her. He tenderly and softly looks at her, smiles at her, and says these words. Didn't I tell you? that you would see God's glory if you believe? It's like, Martha, I think you confuse me with everyone else in your life. If I say it, it's happening. You can trust. You can believe. And it's the same thing he'd say to me and the same thing he'd say to you. If you consider yourself a Christian today, when you decided to become a Christian and to put your faith in him, it wasn't a might happen. It wasn't a maybe happen. It was a guarantee. You will experience God's glory in your life. God will turn bad to good. You will experience things you can't explain because God did them on your behalf. And that's what he's reminding Martha in this moment. That's what he wants to remind me and remind you in this moment. And this is what happened next. So they rolled the stone aside. I love this part. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. He's praying out loud. He says, you always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. You know what he's saying? He's like, I am about to blow these people's minds. I know a man is about to walk out of this grave that's been dead for four days. And before it happens, Heavenly Father, I want to make sure they know you did it. I want to make sure that they know the only reason they worship me is because I represent you. Jesus, the Son, without God, the Father, means nothing. And so Jesus is saying, hey, before this happens, before this glory is revealed, I need you to understand, it ain't my glory. I reflect the glory of God the Father. I am here on his behalf. 
I'm here to proclaim you can trust me because I represent him. And so after making it clear who should get the credit, Jesus says these words, Lazarus, come out. And in my mind at that moment, half the crowd whipped their heads up because they'd all been defeated with their head down. They had made their way to the grave, probably didn't even know the stone had been moved, probably didn't even know what Jesus was going to do. They heard those words up. They lived defeated so much longer than they had to. You guys get that it was over the second Jesus showed up, right? The second Jesus showed up, they didn't have to wonder anymore. He's here, something good's going to happen. What? We have no idea. See, that's the promise for all of us in our lives. Regardless of the setback, regardless of the situation, when Jesus shows up, when we place our trust in him, when we say, I believe you, I trust you, we can rest. That his glory is going to be revealed. That something good will come out of the situation. In this case, it just happened to be there, watch their brother come back to life. And that's exactly what happened. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in graves cloths, his face wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. I love how matter of fact Jesus is about all this. You know, it's not like, it's not like, told you. You know, he didn't go like, boom. You know, there was no, there was no mic to drop. He just went about his business, unwrapping him. He's got all that stuff on him. And let's go. Let's move on because we got stuff to do. And watch this. Watch this. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. You think? You think they believed in Jesus after that? When they saw his glory revealed, Wellspring, may I be so bold as to say, God wants to do the very same thing in your life. That pain. That failure, that setback, that thing that has caused you to say, whew, I guess it's over. I guess I'll never get here. I guess I'll never be able to do this. I guess I'll never be able to take that step. You know what God sees? God sees an opportunity to reveal his glory through your faith. He sees an opportunity to not only take you someplace you've never been, but to use you to draw other people to himself. So what's the message behind this miracle? You know it. I've been saying it all the time. Keep your head up. Why? Why do we keep our head up? Because God is still working. How do I know? Because you still have a pulse. You got a pulse. You got a purpose. You're still here for a reason. Which means God's not done. And so despite the setback, despite the struggles... God invites you to trust. God invites you to pick yourself up, to keep your head up, to keep your eyes on your Savior so you can see where he's trying to lead. See, that's the reason keeping your head down is such a struggle. That's the reason living defeated is so debilitating. Think about it. When you live with your head down, the only thing you can see is the present. And the only thing you can even picture is the past. You live in the pain and the guilt and the shame and the defeat of current circumstances. And the only pictures you have are things from the past. So you relive a cycle of it'll never get better. It'll never get better. It'll never get better. Which is why Jesus says, get your head up. Because down here is the present. Down here is the past. Ahead of you is the future. Ahead of you is your heavenly father waiting. I say, I'm here. You can trust me. In fact, if you'd like, I, I, have, a, I have a path and I have a plan. And whoo, I've got a future that's going to blow your mind. But you got to pick your head up. Because it's the only way you can know it's me talking. And it's the only way you can see all the things I'm orchestrating. It's the only way you can be prepared for all the blessings I'm bringing. And it's the only way you can experience the future I have for you. It's the only way you can recognize that it's my hand and my glory being revealed in this journey. So last question. Where are you living defeated right now? 
What area have you given up? What area have you accepted? Well, I guess that will never be. What if? What if the message behind this miracle today is for you? What if today is an invitation? What if today is your Heavenly Father getting right down on His knees and ever so gently taking your chin guiding your face up so that your eyes can lock so he can remind you I love you and I'm not done in fact I've got an amazing plan for your life and then he'll put out his hand and I'll say would you like to join me because he never forces, he always invites. Today could be your moment to stand back up, look your Savior in the eye, and say, I believe. In fact, I believe so much, I'm going to act. I believe so much, I'm going to hope. See, the message behind the raising of Lazarus is that we have permission to hope. We have permission to hope that things will get better. We have permission to hope that God is working something for our good even when we can't see it. And so my challenge today is wherever you've given up hope, wherever you feel defeated, why not pick your head up? Why not seek your Savior? Why not step towards Him and say, I trust you even though I don't know what's happening. But boy, I don't want to miss out on what you're doing. I don't want to miss out on the miracle of this moment. So I'm going to step through the pain. I'm going to step through the hurt. I'm going to fight through it. I'm going to trust you. Because I want to experience what you have planned. Here's what I'll tell you. You do that, your life will get better. Side note, God will also use your faith and obedience to change the lives of people around you. So if you're struggling, if you've given up, I get it. Some of Jesus' best friends did the same thing message today is simple keep your head up because our God is still working let's pray oh Father we love you so much oh, we are so so thankful for your son we're just oh, so thankful for his example and so thankful for his life and so thankful for his sacrifice and thankful for the miracles he performed and what they can mean to us today Father I pray a spirit of encouragement over all of us. May we, may we take comfort in the fact that you are still at work. And God, for those of us struggling, for those of us defeated today, Father, may we have the courage to hope. May we have the courage to look towards you. May we have the courage to lift our heads up so that we can begin to pursue the path you have planned for our lives. We love you. We thank you. See you in your son's name we pray. Amen.